Buenas tardes, uh, good evening, welcome to the, this new edition of Poetry Readings, which is a central part of the cultural program of the Instituto of Cervantes in Manchester and Leeds. Uh, this afternoon, we will enjoy the work of this excellent poet, novelist and essayist, Mariano Peiru, with the launch of uh, his book, the translation into English of his book, Possibilities in Sight. Uh, before I pass the floor to the translator, uh, uh, Terence Dole, I will also give some uh, details about his curriculum. And first of all, I would like to, to uh, thank to all of you, to Terence, to Mariano, to our audience for being with us uh, today. And uh, especially for our special guests, uh, Mariano, the first time, and Charles, as I said, who collaborates with the Institute of Cervantes regularly, in Cervantes in Manchester and Leeds. Uh, most recently, uh, he uh, also participated in the launch of the book of Martin uh, Gijón's Surrendering. And before that, also in this uh, uh, place, in this channel, um, of Cervantes Institute in 2020, he also presented, participated in the launch of the 10 Contemporary Spanish Women Poets. Uh, thank you again. Uh, Dole, uh, Dole is uh, himself a poet, as well as a translator of Spanish poetry, and he's author of many other, many other books, The Way of It, Chocoloro, in prose, and also uh, mentioning his translations, just to say a few of them. In Sherman Books, uh, he has present, um, he has translated selected poems and My Father by Eduardo Moga, The Year of Crab and Possibilities in Shade by Mariano Peru tonight, Surrendering by Mariano Martin Gijón, as I mentioned. Also, uh, uh, he translated Affordable Angst by Mercedes Tebrian and The Enchanted Idols by Daniel Samoloivich. Master of Distances by Jordi Dose, and the anthologies of streets where the world to, is to embark Spanish poets in London, 1811, 2018. Um, thank you again. Uh, we will uh, have a great pleasure uh, with poetry tonight again, as it is usual in our uh, poetry readings, uh, there will be a discussion tonight between, uh, between um, Mariano, the author, and the translator, Terence. And at the end of the reading and the conversation, we will also have some time for your comments and for your questions from the audience. So thank you again to everybody. And without further ado, the floor is yours, Terence. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Pedro. Um, it's a, a great delight for me to introduce the poetry of Mariano Peru. I, I really admire and enjoy, enjoy his poems a great deal. And I've now translated three of his books, uh, three of his more recent ones. He's, he's published um, um, 12 books of poetry, and I'm glad to say the 13th, I think, is, is due soon. Uh, and also for uh, uh, works of fiction, wonderful, uh, funny novels, uh, funny and serious. I suppose funny and serious is what you could say about all of, all of his work, really. Um, Mariano was born in um, Argentina uh, and moved to Madrid when he was five. Uh, he's a musician, and I think you can see that in the poems. Um, very much. There's, a, there's very much musical form in the poems. Uh, he plays the saxophone. He teaches uh, music and creative writing. And uh, uh, he's also an essayist, has, has written on music and uh, on poetry. Um, Mariano is going to start reading from his new book, uh, Possibilities in Shade, uh, uh, in the Spanish first, and then I shall... I shall give you the English, and we're going to see on screen the poems. So, uh, possibilidad is in la sombra. Uh, uh, I'll give you over to Mariano. Thank you very much, Terence, and hi, everybody. 
Um, special thanks to Pedro Eusebio and the Instituto Cervantes. And also I want to say hi to Tony and Eduardo Pablo uh, and all the Dooley brothers and sisters. <laughs> um, and everybody else, of course. Okay, I will start reading this from this book, Posibilidades en la Sombra. Tal vez ese ojo no sea bello, pero yo lo veo bello porque puedo entrar en él y verme bello, triste y aceptado, frágil y pequeño, volando por encima de las cosas del mundo. Tal vez ese ojo no me mire como yo lo veo. Yo era ese ojo. Yo seré ese ojo. Hay otro ojo al lado y no es igual. Yo no soy ninguno de ellos. La diferencia que hay entre esos ojos tal vez sea la misma que hay entre nosotros. Cuando tus ojos me miran y yo entro en tu ojo y veo cosas que no ves, que no hay, el dolor, el cansancio. Ese ojo es un salto, una promesa, un hito, como cerca de las cataratas había un hito, una piedra que marcaba el lugar de una promesa antes de que existiera el mundo y se rompiera. Antes de que existiera el mundo y se rompiera, había un jardín. Era una foto de un jardín con una mesa y cuatro sillas y una se había caído para atrás. Un terremoto tira una silla para atrás y eso no está en tus ojos. En tus ojos hay otros jardines, no hay tiempo todavía. En tu nariz hay tiempo. El tiempo sube por tu frente y no se ve. Tal vez tu padre pueda meter las manos hasta las muñecas en un río de sangre, lavarse las manos en sangre. Tal vez me cures el miedo o me inocules el miedo, pero eso ahora está detrás y tiene la presencia intermitente del deseo. Todo es aquí deseo, pero ¿deseo de qué? De tiempo, de sangre, de tener 20 años para no saber, no la energía sino la deriva de los 20 años. Deseo de descansar y de que algo no termine nunca. Tal vez el calor baste para apagar esa pregunta, o el sabor, o una forma nueva de dormir y mirarse. O tal vez no se trate de apagar, sino de alumbrar otro sol, cuando subes y bajas, sugiriendo otros soles, otra sangre. Nada de esto está en ti, ahora, ni yo sé nada de tu miedo o tu deriva. Sé que había una silla tirada para atrás en el jardín y que tú me miras. Tal vez en la proximidad destaque la diferencia. Tus ojos están cerca de tu boca, que se abre o se rompe para que sigan fluyendo los ríos y abre o rompe la lógica del miedo. Cuando tu boca se rompe, te creo. Cuando tu boca se abre, te toco. Now we go back on and uh, I, I start reading that in English. Perhaps that eye isn't beautiful, but I see it as beautiful because I can enter it and see myself as beautiful, sad and accepted, fragile and small, flying above the things of the world. Perhaps that eye doesn't see me as I see it. I was that eye. I will be that eye. There's another eye next to it, a different eye, and I am neither one. The difference between those eyes is perhaps the difference between you and me. When your eyes look at me and I enter your eye and see things you don't see, things not there, pain, weariness. That eye is a leap, a promise, a landmark. Just as by the waterfalls there was a stone that marked the place a promise was made before the world existed and was broken. Before the world existed and was broken, there was a garden. It was a photo of a garden with a table and four chairs. And one of the chairs had been thrown on its back. An earthquake throws over a chair. And this isn't in your eyes. In your eyes are other gardens. Time isn't in them yet. In your nose, there is time. Time climbs your forehead unseen. Perhaps your father can place his hands up to the wrists in a river of blood, wash his hands in blood. Perhaps you'll cure my fear or inject me with fear. 
but that is behind now and implies the intermittent presence of desire. All is desire here, but desire for what? For time, for blood, for being 20 and not knowing. Not the energy, but the drift of being 20. Desire for rest and for something not to end. Perhaps heat is enough to doubt that question, or taste, or a new way of sleeping and looking at each other. Or perhaps it's not dousing, but lighting up another sun. When you rise and fall, proposing other suns, other blood. None of this is you now, and I know nothing of your drift or fear. I know that there was a chair thrown on its back in the garden, and that you were looking at me. Perhaps in nearness, the difference shines out. Your eyes are near your mouth. It opens or breaks, so rivers keep on flowing, and opens or breaks the logic of fear. When your mouth breaks, I believe you. When your mouth opens, I touch you. So perhaps I could ask you about the chair thrown on its back, Mariano. That, that's a very intriguing image. Perhaps you don't want to say anything more about the poem. It says everything itself. But uh... <laughs> I don't want to say anything, but I will. Um, that chair, I think, as many times uh, as, as usually happens, many of the images of my poems, or of any poem, I guess, um, comes from reality, but means something different in reality, or something like that. Um, in this case, I'm not completely sure, but I think a, a friend of mine told me about a, a very small earthquake that, um, that was here in Madrid some years ago. And she said that all that had happened uh, was that a chair fell. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, a, I don't know, like a kind of bathos. Um, I think this is the concept, no? Like... A kind of minor disaster. Or, yes, but uh, very minor. <laughs> <laughs> so, but still a sort of note of unease. Uh, is yes, there but then I, th I thought that the, the it was a very powerful image in, in, in a new way, right? So then I connected that fallen chair with um, a garden that I had when I lived with my parents and my sister and with the fact that my mother had died. And it was like this stupid or I don't know irrelevant image suddenly became uh, very powerful for me or very meaningful and then I just used it and I think if you just use um, um, anything with uh, faith in a poem almost anything it can work this yeah I think I, I, there's a great emotional charge in it and mm -hmm. in some and in the rest of your uh, a lot of your imagery about the rivers and mountains perhaps we'll see a bit more in in the second half would you like to read the second yeah, sure. oh, we're just reading from the beginning here by the way of the of yeah, the poem um the book is is a book length poem uh and musically returns and returns to some of this imagery and uh uh especially the looking the looking the eyes and but anyway go on mariano yes Miro fotos que muestran cosas que no están en las fotos. Hay alguien esperando y alguien que camina. Miro la foto y veo la tristeza de una silla. Tal vez quieras ayudarme a levantarla o sentarte en el suelo a su lado. Yo quiero darle una patada, quemarla, sacarla de la foto. Tal vez podamos bajar al río, meternos hasta las rodillas en el río, calzados, para no cortarnos una hora metidos en el río hasta las rodillas y cambiaría nuestro concepto de esperanza. Mi concepto de esperanza tal vez se parezca al tuyo como un río se parece a su valle o a su catarata, o como este río se puede parecer a tu boca cuando no la miro o cuando estamos metidos hasta las rodillas en el río una hora. Es raro lo de los parecidos, cuando hay un río en medio o veinte años. Desde mi orilla, el concepto de esperanza está gastado, 
pero la esperanza no. Desde la tuya todavía no ha acabado de formarse. En eso se parecen, como no mirarte se parece a rozar tu boca, o un río se parece a verlo desde lejos. Tal vez a esa silla no la haya tirado un terremoto, sino el peso de la esperanza. Thank you. I look at photos that show things that aren't in the photos. Someone is waiting and someone is in motion. I look at the photo and see the sadness of a chair. Perhaps you'd like to help me write the chair or sit down on the ground next to it. I want to kick it, burn it, expunge it from the photo. Perhaps we can go down to the river and walk into the river up to our knees with our shoes on so as not to cut our feet. After an hour in the river, up to our knees, our concept of hope would be redefined. My concept of hope perhaps is much like yours, as a river is like its valley or its waterfalls, or as this river may be like your mouth when I'm not looking at it, or when we are up to our knees in the river for an hour. It's strange the likeness when a river is between us for 20 years. From my bank, the concept of hope is used up, but hope itself isn't. From yours, the concept hasn't taken shape. They are alike in that, as not looking at you is like lightly touching your mouth, or a river is like seeing it from far away. Perhaps that chair wasn't thrown over by an earthquake, but by the weight of hope. Tal vez prefieras subir una montaña lentamente para ver qué hay al otro lado. No hay nada al otro lado. O tal vez estemos tú y yo bajando una montaña. ¿Qué te gustaría ver ahí? Una segunda oportunidad. Un fracaso merecido. Un sentimiento mutuo. Una emoción fugaz. Una montaña. Y tal vez, si me rozas, pueda descubrir lo que me gustaría ver a mí. Una reacción visceral, un dilema ético, una persona mirando una montaña. Pero tal vez donde tú ves una montaña, yo vea un río. Donde tú ves un dolor leve, yo vea una promesa. Donde tú ves agua, yo vea sangre. O tal vez yo vea un símbolo donde tú ves un rastro. Yo vea una mirada limpia donde tú ves una cosa, y donde tú ves un jardín, yo vea una silla caída. Hoy he visto en un sueño lo que había al otro lado de la montaña, pero ya no lo recuerdo. Sé que era un poco previsible, pero no decepcionante. Algo encajaba. Como a veces las cosas encajan en los sueños y en la vigilia, todo es discordancia. Esa forma en que encajan las cosas en los sueños... Tal vez sea lo que busco en la vigilia, cuando miro tus ojos o tu boca, cuando subo una montaña y pienso en lo que verás tú, cuando entro en tu ojo para verme mirándote, despierto y activo, ilusionado, nuevo. Yeah, there we are. Thank you, sorry. Perhaps you prefer to climb a mountain at leisure, to see what's on the other side. There's nothing on the other side. Or perhaps there's you and me coming down a mountain. What would you like to see there? A second chance? A well-deserved failure? A mutual feeling? A fleeting emotion? A mountain? And perhaps if you touch me, I can find out what I'd like to see. A gut reaction? An ethical dilemma? Someone looking at a mountain? But perhaps where you see a mountain, I see a river. Where you see an ache, I see a promise. Where you see water, I see blood. Or perhaps I see a symbol where you see a trail. I see an open gaze where you see a thing. And where you see a garden, I see a chair on its back. Today I saw in a dream what there was on the other side of the mountain, but I can't remember now. I know it was somewhat predictable, but not disappointing. Something fit as something, as things sometimes fit in dreams, 
and in waking life all is discord. The way things rhyme in dreams, perhaps is what I'm looking for awake. When I look at your eyes or mouth, when I climb a mountain and think of what you'll see up there, when I enter your eye to see myself looking at you, bright, alive, excited, new. So is there something about um, the difference between age and experience uh, and and youth in, in the poem? Is there uh, trying to understand over a, a gap of time another person? Oh. What, did you hear that bit? Sorry. No, I, uh, not the end. Hmm? Something about uh, the difference between age and experience, but I... Well, yes, about, about trying to understand uh well it's obviously about trying to understand what another person is thinking but is there some, something about understanding younger people or yeah it has something to do with that of course um the different this 20 years no this 20 years difference yes yeah it's there but it's also i think uh the trying to understand what one thinks of the other person you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's not so much, in my opinion, which is just one opinion, um, it's not so much about what the other person thinks, but um, what one thinks of everything, no? All the book, I yeah. think, is like a projection or a fantasy about what could happen, what is there in the shade and might become true. And the, the fun part or the interesting part or the moving part is that in a way it doesn't matter as much, so much um, what happens but what we can imagine what we can make of things before they become real i think that's my search there or my i don't know the way what i want to investigate or to play with yeah no it's it's wonderful wonderfully playful and moving at the same time it's, um so this book was was uh, poetry book of the year for the uh, spanish newspaper el mundo in in 2019 possibilities in shade and we're also going to talk about um the first book of mariano's that i translated um which was a a, a poetry book society choice uh el año del cangrejo in the in the year of the crab uh, and we're going to read a, a bit from that as well and um all the books of uh, Marianas I read, uh, while recognised with the same voice, uh, have been very interestingly different. And I think this one again um, in the, um, the Year of the Crab is is, uh, is different. Uh, but anyway, you'd see when Mariana starts reading from it. Is that right? Um, uh, yeah, I think maybe what makes it um, similar in a way, or some um, point of contact, is that both are, as you said before, uh, book-length poems. Yes. And somehow, I think that's the challenge for me in these two books, to keep um, something, some, some tension or some intensity or some electricity through so many pages. So maybe um, you have to, or I had to, use the same i don't know the, i don't know the proper word i don't want to say tricks but it's something like that right like the same strategies maybe to keep the tension or to keep the speech alive and for sure i, I think there the strategies are different but there is something in common and it has to do with music as you said very very cleverly i think okay so i will go from nuestros dibujos Nuestros dibujos eran cada vez más libres, pero la libertad es algo del cuerpo. Ella algunas veces nos hablaba. Su dialecto luchaba contra el dialecto local. El sol parecía siempre el mismo. Pensé que la luna era el silencio y la libertad del sol. Mi trabajo terminaba cuando los viajeros eran capaces de escuchar su propio silencio. Pensé que el dialecto local se parecía al lenguaje del agua. Nubes, agujas, cangrejos y olas. Y el nueve, al final de todo, como un sol, para volver a empezar. 
pensé que todos los muertos eran el mismo muerto. Our drawings were getting freer, but freedom is a thing of the body. She spoke to us sometimes. The dialect struggled with the local dialect. The sun always looked the same. I thought the moon was the silence and freedom of the sun. My work was complete when the travelers could hear their own silence. I thought the local dialect was like the language of the water, clouds, needles, crabs, and waves, and the nine at the end of everything, like a sun to start all over again. I thought all the dead people were the same dead. Un día dibujamos una vela hecha de viento, un cangrejo hecho de verano, un aeropuerto hecho de recuerdos, un dialecto hecho de deseos contradictorios. Según cuenta la Biblia, hay un pájaro hecho de cielo, un barco hecho de mar. Según cuenta la Biblia, nadie tiene ningún interés por esa clase de dibujos. Un día dibujamos un túnel y después otro. Dibujamos una luna hecha de túneles, una luna hecha de nombres, un sol hecho de lunas, una luna hecha de agua. Según cuenta la Biblia, nadie puede dibujar su luna secreta. Dibujamos un pinar hecho de agujas, una hoja hecha de árboles, una mente hecha de dibujos, una palabra hecha de despedidas. Dibujamos un pasado hecho de niños, una ola hecha de olas, un mar hecho de símbolos y senderos sinuosos. Dibujamos una playa hecha de escobas y miedo y ganas de volar. One day we drew a sail made of wind, a crab made of summer, an airport made of memories, a dialect made of opposing desires. The Bible says there's a bird made of sky, a boat made of sea, The Bible says nobody has the least interest in that kind of drawing. One day we drew a tunnel and then another one. We drew a moon made of tunnels, a moon made of names, a sun made of moons, a moon made of water. The Bible says no one can draw his secret moon. That's my favorite line in the poem, among many. So we drew a pine wood made of needles, a leaf made of trees, a mind made of drawings, a word made of goodbyes. We drew a past made of children, a wave made of waves, a sea made of symbols and winding paths. We drew a beach made of brooms and fear and the wish to take to the air. Algunas tardes nos quedábamos en la playa cuando los socorristas ya se habían ido. Escuchábamos el diálogo de las olas y el viento y mirábamos las pequeñas marcas que había sobre la arena, los restos del día, un idioma sin abstracciones. El telegráfono se alejaba y yo me acercaba a su distancia. Había que respetar todas sus distancias. Eso me preocupaba mucho. Las olas se alejaban del viento que las empujaba lejos. Ella se alejaba de todo y se acercaba a todo y hacía falta un idioma con abstracciones para tratar de entender su deriva y su vaivén. Sometimes we stayed on the beach after the lifeguards had gone. We listened to the dialogue between the wind and the waves and looked at the marks that were in the sand, the remains of the day a language with no abstract nouns. The telegraphone withdrew and I approached his distance. All these distances had to be respected. That was much on my mind. The waves withdrew from the wind that pushed them further out. She withdrew from everything and approached everything. And you needed a language with abstract nouns to try and grasp her drift and oscillation. En sus largas excursiones por la playa, el telegráfono pescaba cangrejos. Según cuenta la Biblia, la mejor manera de pescar un cangrejo es coger una lapa, separar la carne de la concha 
y anudarla al extremo de un cordel. Después se sumerge el cordel y el cangrejo se lanza desde su roca, nadando bajo el agua, y atrapa el cebo y no lo suelta cuando uno tira del cordel hasta que saca el cangrejo y lo deposita en un cubo rojo. La mejor manera de pescar un cangrejo tenía que ser la más divertida. El telegráfono cogía a los cangrejos de modo que sus pinzas no pudieran hacerle ningún daño. A veces los cogía por una pata y los sostenía en el aire. El cangrejo parecía bailar, suspendido en un cielo minúsculo, agitando las otras nueve patas, tal vez esperando, tal vez aterrorizado, tal vez simplemente cumpliendo con sus actividades cotidianas, tal vez soñando con dibujos en los que no volvería a aparecer hasta dentro de algún tiempo, sintiendo una pata, nueve patas, mientras un universo enorme y extraño resolvía su destino sin prisa, sin ansiedad. On his long excursions up the beach, the telegraphone fished for crabs. The Bible says the best way to fish for crabs is to get a limpet, cut the meat out of the shell and tie it on a string. Then you lower the string into the water and the crab leaps from its rock, swims underwater and seizes the bait and doesn't let go when you pull on the string until you've hiked out the crab and dropped it into a red bucket. The best way to fish for a crab had to be the most fun way. The telegraphone picked up the crabs in such a way that their pincers couldn't hurt him. Sometimes he picked them up by one leg and held them up in the air. The crab seemed to be dancing, hanging in a tiny sky, waving its other nine legs, maybe hopeful, maybe terrified, maybe just going about its business maybe dreaming of drawings it wouldn't appear in again for a good while, feeling one leg, nine legs, while a vast, strange universe decided its fate, unhurriedly, unworriedly. Well, a, a whole book is, is a, a, a memory poem of a summer holiday, isn't it? Uh, a, a long summer holiday with family and children. The telegraphone is your son, isn't he? Uh, or partly your son, a fictionalized version of your son. Uh, and there's also a sadness in the poem from, uh, is, was it your mother dying at the time? Or uh, was that, a, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the thing, the, um, she said, no, not my poems, obviously. Um, she is in the next book after she died, but she's also, I mean, the next book is the one we talked about previously, Possibilities and oh, Shame. Yeah. And this book is, uh, I wrote it before, and it's just uh, during the summer in which um, it was clear that she was going to die soon with cancer. So we, I know all these elements. I don't think it's a very sad book, actually. It's also about the possibilities in shade. Now that I think about it, it's, this is for the first time. Um, I mean, I never th thought about this before, but this poem is also about mainly about the death of my mother but before it happened it's like the preparation for it uh, while some adults knew it was going to happen and some and the children were there and they didn't know anything and we kind of lived all this again small tragedy um, um, in a double way i mean from the adult point of view and but also from the children's point of view which was kind of more tragic i think i don't know if it's clear what i'm trying to to say but it's like if you imagine how a child live uh, is going to live or to experience the death of somebody that he or she loves a lot it's more tragic that than if you're just an adult and your mother dies when it's more or less um, the right time for it more or less you know so all this, but anyway, all of these um, elements are not there in a very tragic or dramatic or exaggerated way, but just like their energy, as I said before, is there, but it makes it, it, it I don't know, how, it, it is conveyed through other uh, characters, which are kind of enigmatic and so my child um, is just the tel this telegraphone, <laughs> which is a nickname that he invented for himself. 
and um, it's like a strange animal, um, which he said he was, and which, when I look back, I have to admit that he was. <laughs> but there, there's great joy in the in the in the whole book from from the ch activities of the children, isn't there? Uh, because they haven't yet found out ab about. Uh, their grandmother the, the, yeah. the, there's a lot of uh, playfulness and and especially from these drawings and there's an enormous amount of verbal playfulness which you're so good at as well in the in the poem uh, i really think it's a joy to read that book i wonder if we could go on to um uh, your latest book i've also translated and i hope tony who's see us going to consider taking it. it it's different again it's a whole series of extremely formally playful poems uh with um uh, it's hard to describe but perhaps we could read one of them which is uh, uh a sort of uh, uh might have some connection with uh, british nonsense verse almost uh, edward lear or something like that <laughs> your sotana poem could we read that one <laughs> yes i want to ask you i think i'm allowed to ask one question yeah I allow myself to ask one question, and it's this one. Why is that line? Which was the line that you said it, it was your favorite one, and why? Oh, about uh, um, I just love that whole section, but it, it's uh, uh, no, where is it now? Uh, it's the Bible says, No one can draw his secret moon. I love all your the Bible says. <laughs> there's, there's loads of good ones all throughout the book. The Bible says this, uh, um, uh, Bible says the most uh, uh, things that you might not be able to find in the Bible. But I think that's quite a, a religious utterance. No one can draw his secret mood. <laughs> anyway, that's, <laughs> that's that was the, my favorite line. You, would you like to, Would you like to read the Sotana? Sure. Uh, Yes, now that we're uh, set on a religious ground, right, <laughs> with the Bible, <laughs> now we have another religious poem. Sota Letania. Okay. Sota Letania. Este paraguas pudo haber sido una sotana. Oiga, su sotana me ha mordido. Para esta sotana hay diferentes remedios. La próxima temporada la sotana se llevará verde y de lino. He vuelto a olvidar la sotana en el tranvía. Átonas pero infalible estilete, las hormigas abandonan el pentagrama y se internan en el oído, procesión sonora y encarnación de la idea. Otra sotana llena de humo. Arráncame la sotana. Dos sotanas por el precio de tres. Y vas por ahí con la sotana manchada de sopa. Tus caricias son como una sotana para mí. Anotas notas sucedáneas como si nada, pero algo, la irritación no se te cae del cuerpo delictivo. Debajo de la sotana está la pólvora. Se oye un revuelo lejano. Deben ser las sotanas. ¿Puedo tocar la sotana un ratito? Esa sotana podría amamantarnos a todos. Han llegado hasta el núcleo a golpe de sotana. ¿A santo de qué retornarían al sanatorio si ya han empuñado el martillo y sobre el yunque forjan una sensualidad que incluirá ojos, labios y hasta nariz en algún caso? Continuad hasta que la sotana se derrame. Cualquier sotana descubre más de lo que cubre. No la menciones más. Un recuerdo turbio de sotanas y salvado. Aparta un poco la sotana y cabremos los tres. O santa si la prefieres chica, oye voces, roba poco y no suele bailar. So Marianne has put various impossibilities in the way of the translator in, in terms of um, 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 anagrams, uh, which I didn't always notice, so that uh, the, uh, the um, parts in it italics uh, uh, start with uh, anagrams of Sotana, uh, and I've had to do the best I could with that. But <laughs> yeah, and uh, Sotana is a cassock, really. But cassock didn't sound too good in the translation, so I've used the old word for cassock, which was frock. So uh, um, I don't know if it's anti-clerical or I don't know what it's about at all. It seems to me to be a delightful uh, nonsense poem. Anyway, frick frack litany. This brolly could have been a frock. Hey, your frock just bit me. 
There are various cures for this frock. Next season, green linen frocks will be worn. I left my frock on a tram again. Refractively infallible stiletto, the ants abandon the pentagram and march into the ear, a sonorous procession, incarnation of the idea. Another smoking frock, tear off my frock, two frocks for the price of three, and you walk about in your soup-stained frock, your caresses are like a frock to me. You frock fake notes like anything, but nothing. Irritation drips from your corpus delicti. The gunpowder is under the frock. There's a flutter in the distance. It must be the frocks. May I touch the frock a moment? That frock could nurse us all. They got to the core with frock blows. Why the frock would they go back to the sanatorium if they've already grabbed their hammer and are forging on the anvil a sensuality that will include eye, lips, and even occasionally a nose? Continue till the frock is scattered. Any frock uncovers more than it covers. Don't mention it again. A cloudy memory of frocks and bran. Move the frock over a bit, then all three of us will fit. Or frack, if you will, girl, hears voices, doesn't steal much, and usually won't dance. <laughs> I love that poem. <laughs> Has a certain uh, 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 frenzy about it. <laughs> but you read it. I think this is fun to talk about. You read it like um, um, emphasizing that it's fun. And I th like to read it. I don't think it's wrong. Eh? I just yeah. want to mention that I like to read it um, more dramatically. Uh. Because I think there is a contrast with the, I mean, the um, um, playful parts of it or the playful the, the dimension, dimension of it. Yeah. That is more clear and more like the poem itself, right? Like the use of this sotana, this word sotana, uh, frack, frack was it, right? Oh. <laughs> um, which somehow I don't think it's anti clerical, as you said. I think no. it's just like an experiment, a verbal experiment that shows that if you, that shows all that can happen when you repeat things or when you change the place of certain things right like something is here and it means something you put it there and it means something else you put it there 20 times and it means still something else i think that's the serious part of it also of course the fact that this is a symbol of the church or of the clergy uh, makes it i don't know more lear lesque or how do you say that what's the ad adjective of lear <laughs> Not like nonsense, like. Oh yes, more Lear like yes, yeah, -like, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I, that, I mean that's only one of many experiments in the book, and it, it's uh, they uh, I really, I really think they're fantastic. The different things you do in that book, it's a, it's a kind of, uh, um, uh, I don't know, it's a sort of you could take have it as a manual as a way to read read certain kinds of poems, or uh, or it should have a note that everybody could try this and see if it comes out as good as this or something like that. Anyway, yeah, exactly. That's what what I was going to mention, and I think I'm glad that you you did it. Um, I think also part of the some of the points of this book, not all of them are the same, but some of them are like an invitation to the reader to go on playing. You know, like yeah. just this one we read, um, anyone could write another verse with the word Sotana scattered here and there or, or whatever. And this happens with many other list poems which are in the book. And I like to think that it's also like this interactive, every book is interactive, especially poetry books, but um, this is more so. This is like very openly interactive, at least in my mind. Yeah. Well, I think we've probably gone on long enough. We we're going to perhaps read a, a poem from my Tokalora, but I think yeah. we could go straight to a question and answer if you like. Uh, sure. I, don't know, I don't know if people, what does uh, what does Pedro think? Oh, uh, I mean, yeah, this is um, the sixth poem from the, the sequence Tokalora. That's um, in the uh, in um, uh, 
in my book called Tocoloro, which is a um, Spanish-English bilingual edition published by Los Papeles de Brighton, and you can get it uh, from Amazon. Abhorrent to me, you remain, one might say, of a different species as youth is from age or agelessness from the first tentative lines of a sketch that later score, crisscross, hatch, but all beasts are the same in embryo curled up like that before they flatten, lengthen, form, liquefy on paper, become representative of themselves in which all hides as birds in interwoven trees in which all is hidden. Okay, now I will read the Spanish version, translation, by the way, by uh, Eduardo Moga, who is among us. Um, that's not the reason. I will say that the translation is really excellent. Sigue siendo, sigue siendo extranjero para mí. Se podría decir que de otra especie, como la juventud lo es de la madurez, o la intemporalidad de las primeras líneas tentativas de un boceto que luego se marcan, se entrecruzan, eclosionan. Pero todas las bestias son lo mismo cuando son embriones, enroscadas así, antes de aplanarse, de alargarse, de formarse, de licuarse en el papel, de ser representativas de sí mismas, en las que todo se oculta, como los pájaros en los árboles entrelazados, in Los que todo se oculta. Yes, I have to thank Eduardo with all my heart for translating this and then getting it, uh, uh, finding a publisher for it. And I have to thank Mariana too for reading some of the poems from that book uh, on uh, uh, Spanish national radio uh, in the last program, Las Estación Azul. I was very grateful to hear you reading them there. Thank you. But now, if anybody would like to ask a question, but about Mariana, not about me. <laughs> Let them be free. I would uh, suggest that maybe you can put the questions on the chat, but also the microphone is open to if anybody prefer to just to to put the questions directly to to Terence and Mariano. I have a question for you, Mariano. Yeah. And you, you are, uh, you're a poet, but you have also, I mean, you, 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 you write um, uh, not only poetry, but also essays and uh, a no you're a novelist. How, I mean, how different, I mean, it's very different the poetry and, and, and uh, the other aspects of literature. But where do you feel better or is equal for you, the, the feeling? Because uh, uh, the difference are very obvious, but uh, um, it depends very much on the authors. There are authors who have a special link to, to poetry or to the essays, but in other cases, it's just something very similar. What is your, your feeling about those different aspects of your works? It's very interesting because this is a very um, usual question that everybody that writes more than one genre uh, receives almost every day, I, I would say, but I never seem to find a proper answer. It's like I don't know what to say about that. It's, uh, it changes all the time. I have a lot to say. It's not that it's not interesting for me, but it's not like a quest, a, a, an answer, right? It's not like a definite answer. Um, for me, writing is quite natural. I mean, for many people, some poets which I really admire and which are really great, they say that um, writing poetry is like an, a big effort, it's like a very um, dramatic and tense activity. And it's not like that for me, although sometimes I write about things which are very tense and dramatic. Sometimes the subjects or the impulse to write is like that, but the activity of writing is like um, improvising in a way, or it has some something light, something, um, I don't know. 
So I feel good with it. I, because your answer was, your question was, um, how do you feel better, no? Or what does it make you feel better? What's the difference? I feel very natural with all kinds of writing, actually. I started writing poetry or publishing poetry. Um, and in a way, I know that the world sees me more as a poet as than as anything else. So I have to accept that and incorp incorporate it to my life. But personally, I think I'm all that I do. I'm involved in all that in an equal uh, way. So maybe the difference, this is something that I sometimes say, and maybe it's a good thing to finish, to stop talking. Um, maybe the difference is that when you write poetry, or when I write poetry, I write about things that I usually don't uh, share with the world for a diversity of reasons. And when I write uh, novels or essays, it's more or less things that I share with the world, that are out there in somehow, you know? Like, if you, well, that's, that's all I want to say. But also the poetry is, is written to be read and to be shared with the, not with the audience, but with the, the people who read your books. Yeah, but it's like, what I mean is that, that it comes from a place which is not very, which is kind of private or hidden or unknown even for me. All that is the place where the poem uh, starts existing and is written, right? And the, the novels or the, the essays are, come from things that already have happened or conversations that I have had uh, there are ideas that I have already tested with people, or in, my, in the case of my essays, they come from my lessons or from my teaching activities. Um, there is a difference yeah. in that way. It's not really, I don't know, I think there is like clear cut, right? Like, absolutely. No, of course. And but, also, um, the, the, I can imagine that uh, the, 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 there are different moments also. Well, I don't know if, if you write poetry while essays or prose at the same time, but it can be the case. So it depends very much on your feeling, no? what you, you are saying, no? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yes, and it, it all happens at the same time. Sometimes even with, with the right hand you write a poem and with the left one you write an essay in some very special moments. And I have also a question for both of you. Uh, uh, we are aware, although I might have this later, but uh, translating poetry uh, is, I mean, I, I, I have the impression you have to recreate the whole uh, process in the sense that, uh, as also Terence said before, it's very difficult to, to translate. How has been the, the, the process of translating the, the book? Uh, you were discussing regularly or Yes, uh, Charles, you translate it and then pre you presented the, the results of some poems to, to Mariano. How was the process? Yeah, that's how we, that's how we do it. Uh, Mariano is very strict and uh, as you can hear, his English is excellent. So, so uh, any time I've um, um, departed from what, what I've uh, uh, been a bit too fanciful in my translation, then, then he corrects me severely. <laughs> and uh, as, as they're his poems. I'm, I'm translating them to make sure that the, his poems can be as good as possible in English. So, uh, so I, I obey him. <laughs> Uh, by the way, I'm still waiting his corrections for the, the latest book, the you know, first Decembers. So he's got to send me his corrections for first Decembers. Too. Yeah, I didn't know it was severe, Terence. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> and you tell me in public. <laughs> um, well, I have to say that first, that uh, it's a very big pleasure to work with Terence. Actually, it's a very big pleasure. I have I have had the luck to work with several or some translators, um, and it's always been very nice and very collaborative. And I think I'm a translator as well. Um, and I think if you have an author who is alive and who is willing to collaborate with you as a translator, you have to use that for sure. That is certain. 
no, no matter if the book is easy or difficult or how good you are as a translator, any, in any case, you, you, we always miss things as translators. It's impossible to, to get it all. Yes. Yeah. We don't know that. So from that point of view or from that um, idea, I dare to um, be severe is not a word I will repeat anymore, but to criticize everything that I find um, improbable. And Terence has an excellent attitude. He, I think he has a very, a great talent for writing, which is the main thing. This book, Tocoloro, is a clear uh, proof of that. It's a wonderful book. Um, and I think he gets really most of the very slight and um, obsessive um, nuances of, my, of what I see in my poems. But sometimes there are some things he misses, especially in these very long books, not very long poems, in which there are, as he said, things that repeat over and over and, and then some variations and then some repetitions, which are in some cases words, but in some other cases are um, syntactic structures. So it's not so easy to have all that in mind. You really have to be um, the author or really crazy to have that in mind yes no there was some musical aspects wasn't it that i, that I, I had to adhere to and, I, and that you pointed that out to me and, and that yeah because that, that's how that those books are built on musical structures as we were talking about about that day and by the way uh, i want to also thank uh, mariano for translating my mother-in-law's Penelope Fitzgerald's novel, uh, Human Voices, he's translated and made an excellent Spanish uh, translation of that. <laughs> so uh, that's mutual translating has gone on, or by proxy. Anyway, so. yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's fun that you mentioned these musical structures, you said, and um, it's of course right, but these musical structures come from, come from poetry. Yeah. I mean, music yeah. works like that because you should, because before, <laughs> Usually, music was associated with poetry and all these uh, verse-like structures in music, these phrases or um, that repeat and have the same um, rhythmic patterns or what, whatever, the same length no, of a phrase of Beethoven or of the Beatles or whoever. This comes from the time when poetry and music were the same thing. So it's actually not really musical structure it, it sounds like music or it feels like music but it is it comes from the way of dealing with words they had uh, long long ago yeah and yes penelope fitzgerald of course is a great link <laughs> <laughs> i think somebody um wrote some something in the chat uh, yeah, some no. comments yes um, they're all thanks i think um, no, when you read your poem in translation, does it change or extend your perception of that poem? That's for you as well, Terence. Ah, uh, I don't <laughs> um, You're amazed uh, uh, that so much of it comes over, that it comes over that, that it's really like reading the same poem. Uh, when you get a, a, an excellent translator like Eduardo uh, was for me. Yeah. What about you? Do you think? Yeah, that... I, I don't know what to say. I have the impression that, that both things happen. But also when you read your poem in, in your own language. I mean, I write the poems and then I forget. I don't forget, but I don't read them usually unless I'm in the process of publishing, right? But then the book comes out and it's somehow... I kind of forget them. And then when I read them again, again, my perception of them changes and also it's like I get deeper into them when I live some time apart or something like that. And when I read the translation, especially when the translation is satisfying, um, it's very strange because it it's like you're in contact with the essence of the poem, right? Like you have, we have this very famous sentence by Robert Frost, the American poet, poetry is what is lost in translation or something like that. But I think poetry is what is kept in translation, what you can keep, or both are true in a way. In my case, when I read the poem, um, my poem translated into English, for example, I have the feeling that 
something of the original is there. I see more of it, which is, I think, what Jane Newberry meant by extend your perception. No, like you can see more, can listen to more of it. And it's also um, a different poem, obviously, because poems are made of words. So it's a very strange feeling. It's yes, uh, it... No, Go sorry, on. I just thought of some, something, yeah. another stupid thing that I wanted to add. It's like maybe like some time passes, some years pass, and then you look at the mirror, right? And then it's like you didn't, you find yourself, or when you meet somebody that you didn't meet, meet, see in 10 years, you see the same person, and also you see the, a different person. And also you see the essential uh, traits of that person, because it's what has kept or has been kept through all this time. It's something like that. Ah, right. Yeah, no, that's a good analogy. Well, thank you everybody for coming. It's been, it's been a great evening. I've really enjoyed it. For, uh, and thank you so much, Mariano. It's a, it's no, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank everybody also. And well, especially the Instituto Cervantes. Uh, ah, yes. Muchísimas gracias a, a Terence y Mariano. Thank you so much. It has been a wonderful evening with your with the poetry. And uh, it's always a, a, even a greater pleasure to have the, the, the poetry in, in both languages, in Spanish and, and English, because you can, you can appreciate the, the nuances in both languages. And also, we are aware also of the difficulty and the beauty of the translation. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you to our audience. I hope, I am sure for the comments that everybody was very happy and enjoying very much the, the evening. And muchísimas gracias. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.